today we're going to be talking about the shoulder complex and going through a review of the anatomy, kinesiology, and biomechanics of this anatomical region. If you'd like a little bit of background information, uh, some optional reading could be chapter 16 in Dutton's uh, fourth edition text. Otherwise, chapter 21 of Raymond's text also will provide a little bit of additional detail. The objectives for this anatomy, kinesiology, and biomechanics review are listed here. We'll be looking at the structures of some of the individual bones, as well as the contributions of these various elements to the overall joint articulation. We'll be looking at both static and dynamic joint stabilization structures, um, as well as the biomechanics of the complex uh, shoulder, uh, including open and closed pack positions, some force couples, things along those lines. Additionally, we'll be looking at the degree of stability versus even instability, instability being um, more of a lack of stability uh, versus an actual uh, pathology. And then ultimately, uh, we'll wrap up by looking at the relationship between muscle imbalance and functional performance of the shoulder complex. Now, James Syriax uh, described the shoulder as follows. He said, and I quote, the shoulder is the most rewarding joint in the body because when a limited or painful movement is found, the finding is seldom ambiguous and often implicates the offending structure. Now, while this is mostly true, uh, there are some areas of differential diagnosis and pathology that can be a little bit more ambiguous or can be a little bit harder to understand. And part of the reason why uh, we now recognize this to be true is due to a deeper understanding of the neuromatrix, uh, neurophysiologic effects, as well as the complexity of pain. And unfortunately, oftentimes, uh, pain can be more than just related to a musculoskeletal or biomechanical uh, issue. And so as we are looking at anatomy, kinesiology, and biomechanics, keep that concept in mind. We'll start by looking at the shoulder complex as an overview. And there really are five bones that we want to be aware of uh, with four articulations. Um, that consists of three true joints as well as two kind of false joints or spaces. And so the main bones that we look at are the scapula, the clavicle, the humerus, the sternum, and then additionally the dorsal surface of the first rib. Within those, there are three joints. The first being the sternoclavicular joint. That would be the more proximal midline articulation uh, between the proximal end of the clavicle and the sternum. Then we have the acromioclavicular joint. That would be the distal end of the clavicle as it articulates with the acromion process of the scapula. And then finally, we have the glenohumeral joint, which is made up of the glenoid fossa of the scapula articulating with the proximal humoral head. There are some additional spaces and, and false or pseudo joints that we want to be aware of. Uh, first being the scapulothoracic joint. This isn't a really a true joint. We call it a pseudo joint because it lacks an articular space, lacks articular cartilage. Additionally, we have what's known as the acromiohumoral space or the subacromial space that lies just inferior uh, to the acromion process but superior to the proximal head of the humerus. As we look at how these uh, different joints are, are made up, uh, in the top left hand side we can see the sternoclavicular joint. Uh, there is an articular disc that is present there as well as an articular space. As we follow that out along uh, the, the portion of the clavicle to the AC or chromioclavicular joint, we can see the uh, articulation between the distal uh, clavicle and the acromion and that being just superior then to the glenohumeral joint. Additionally, you can appreciate both the anterior and posterior aspects of these joints uh, within these netter images. So then let's start first by talking about the AC joint, the acromion clavicular joint. It is a plain type synovial joint with gliding uh, that occurs here. Uh, we do not, however, see articular cartilage, rather it's fiber cartilage that exists at the ends of these structures. Sometimes we can see an articular disc, that's kind of in contrast to what we see at the SC joint where there is an articular disc. And clinically what this means is that if a disc is present, there could be some uh, subjecting to tearing that could occur with blunt force trauma to the end of the shoulder. Uh, 
However, uh, we have some strong ligamentous support structures uh, that help to statically stabilize this joint. And specifically, this is where we find the coracoacromial, or excuse me, coracoclavicular ligament. Uh, we'll talk about the coracoacromial ligament in just a second, but coracoclavicular ligament. And of this, we have uh, two portions. We have the conoid and the trapezoid ligaments, which you can see here. And really this ligament is named for where it attaches and inserts, right? So the corico, the root of this, it attaches to the coracoid process. Clavicular is what it attaches to superiorly, to the clavicle. And then it's divided into these two points. Additionally, we have the acromioclavicular ligament. Uh, that actually provides uh, some of the, 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 the capsule, if you will. Um, and uh, additionally, the coracoacromial uh, ligament as well. Um, however, this is not part of the AC joint. The coracoacromial ligament would go from uh, the acromion uh, down to the coracoid process. So again, just providing a little bit more uh, static stability and really the roof, if you will, um, uh, more superior anterior to the glenohumeral joint. The real important thing though to take away from the AC joint is it is going to provide a link from the shoulder girdle to the clavicle and it's tied to all motions of the humerus. Okay, The clavicle is the only skeletal attachment to the axial skeleton. Right, The glenohumeral joint is attached to the trunk and the thoracic rib cage via soft tissue. However, it only is attached to the rest of the skeleton via the clavicle. That's its only attachment, right? And so all the motions of the shoulder girdle are going to have an impact on the clavicle and specifically the AC joint. It does lack a true capsular pattern um, and its closed pack position is probably only achievable in the below 30 age group. Um, and so clinically this would seem to correspond to approximately 90 degrees of glenohumeral joint abduction. We aren't really able to determine the open pack position, although uh, research has suggested that it likely is going to be when the arm is next to the side in a resting position. Now the AC joint is predisposed to not only overuse what we would call micro trauma, where there's repetitive high demand that's required, but also to macro trauma or what we would call direct trauma. And that would be one specific incidence of a high velocity, um, high force injury. Now, there could also be some other non or atraumatic factors that could also impact this, um, though it's typically this uh, comparison and contrasting between micro and macro trauma. If it is macro trauma, um, we are, are likely to see a sprain. And so the mechanism of injury is likely to be one of two things. The first being a fall on the tip of the shoulder. And this is what uh, Sam Bradford suffered in 2009. Um, additionally, it could be a Fouche injury, which is common uh, as far as a mechanism of injury throughout the upper extremity. And Fouche is an acronym for fall on outstretched hand. That AC joint injury is then graded according to the degree of not only ligamentous injury, but separation um, of the two articular spaces. When we look at AC joint sprains then, uh, these were originally described by Allman and Tossi in the mid to late 60s, and there really are only three grades. Grade one would be considered a mild overstretch of that superior ligament of the capsule. Uh, we really wouldn't see a lot of disruption in the joint, and so it would appear normal, though pain would likely be present. Grade two is where that AC ligament is now torn, and we see a sprain of the coracoclavicular ligament, though it remains intact. So in, in essence, we're looking at some laxity here. There's widening of the joint space and pain continues to be present, but this is also when we begin to see some deformity take place. And so sometimes we'll describe this as a step-off deformity, or there's this characteristic bump that appears on that lateral portion of the joint. Finally, there's grade three. Now, since Allman and Tossi originally described this in the 60s, um, Grade four, five, and six have been suggested, though really the, the, the treatment doesn't look very uh, dissimilar. Rather, rather um, it's more radiographic uh, uh, imaging and findings that really differentiate these grades. So again, we're gonna stick with this idea of only three grades. With a grade three, we have complete disruption, not only of the uh, acromioclavicular ligament, but also the coracoclavicular ligament. So that would be both the conoid and trapezoid um, uh, portions there.
And so this is oftentimes referred to as a separated shoulder. And now the displacement of the clavicle is, is superior as there's no static stabilizers to really restrain its movement. Okay. Um, at that point, the treatment is usually conservative. The idea is to manage symptoms, inflammation, and then gradually return this individual to activity. Um, in rare cases, they will um, uh, surgically stabilize or even resect the distal clavicle if symptoms are unable to be stabilized and mitigated um, based off of conservative treatment. And so what this looks like is this, right? We have our acromiocavicular ligament as well as our coracoacromial uh, ligament, but that remains intact. Rather, it's the AC ligament that is disrupted, okay? Um, and then we have the two portions of our coracoclavicular ligament. So um, that being the trapezoid and the conoid. Again, grade one, slight overstretch. Grade two, you are going to have some AC ligament uh, tearing. And then grade three is AC and CC ligaments are torn. So radiographically, if we were to look at a grade three sprain, this is what we would see. There's separation of the AC joint. There is superior migration, and you can actually visualize the coracoid process in this image as well and see that there's a significant distance between the distal clavicle and that bony prominence. So we see that here. And then we can visualize the fall on the tip of the shoulder in this image. And this is really where we want to compare and contrast. Is it an acromioclavicular or a clavicle injury, right? And so this would either be that distal joint or it could be the, the bone itself, right? So again, remember we said there's really two mechanisms of injury. One would be a fall on the tip of the shoulder or a foosh, fall on outstretched hand. Okay, but in both these instances, we need some macro trauma. We need a direct blow. Okay, and the vast majority of injuries are going to be anterior or posterior subluxation of the clavicle. It's not typically superior or inferior. Okay, if there is anterior subluxation, uh, and and that will then impact the sternoclavicular joint, um, you should be able to feel a difference really between the clavicle and the manubrium because you're going to tear the anterior SC ligament. Okay. Um, however, if it were to sublux posteriorly, right, um, that can disrupt the SC as well. But now what's going to occur is the proximal SC joint and the clavicle is going to protrude into that visceral portion of the neck. And so if you think about the structures that lie just behind that, um, that's the windpipe, right? Your trachea, uh, the esophagus, there's some vasculature in there as well, right? And so um, an individual may have some trouble speaking, and this is oftentimes far more of a, an emergency uh, situation to ensure that um, the uh, symptoms that you're seeing do not become permanent. Okay? Um, the forces have to be quite high. Normally, uh, the bone is going to fracture before it's going to dislocate because of the extreme strength of those ligaments. All right? uh, and so, you know, appreciate, for example, in this image, the difference in trunk orientation uh, as well as the shoulder relative to the ground. When the clavicle is going to fracture, the trunk is far more vertical and the, the arm begins to outstretch. When it's SC disruption, you'll notice that the trunk is more in a horizontal position. And so um, it's more perpendicular to the force versus parallel, All right? Again, we said that while micro and macro trauma are the biggest issues, you can have some atraumatic or degenerative changes that are seen as well. Um, however, even there, these really do typically follow an AC sprain. And so the signs and symptoms here are AC and joint tenderness, the palpation, even crepitus. Um, again, only in severe cases will they uh, choose to go the route of cervical uh, resection of this joint. So we started talking about the SC joint, sternoclavicular joint. Um, let's look at it a little bit uh, more in depth now. Uh, it too is a synovial joint. However, uh, unlike the AC, which was plain type, this is a cellar or saddle type joint. And it's formed by the articulation between the clavicle and the sternum. Uh, and here we do see an articular disc, right? It's, it's very, very stable statically. There's strong capsule and ligamentous support. Uh, the primary ligament that kind of maintains the integrity of this joint is what's known as the costoclavicular ligament. So occurring between uh, the clavicle and that first rib, right? 
Additionally, um, the SC serves as a fulcrum for shoulder movements. And so, as I mentioned earlier, it's really the only bony attachment of the shoulder girdle to the axial skeleton. And so, uh, at the SC joint, we see things like elevation, depression, protraction, retraction, upward and downward rotation. The osteo and arthrokinematics that exist here is there is a closed pack position. It's maximum arm elevation and protraction, whereas the open pack position is still, uh, you know, somewhat uh, up for de debate. It's similar though to what we saw with the AC joint, which means it is at resting position with arm by the side, and there really is not a capsular pattern for this joint. We do see SC joint pathology, um, though uh, it's less frequent than AC joint. Um, and again, that's because of the support provided by the ligaments. It's very, very stable. Uh, trauma to the clavicle usually is going to fracture rather than dislocate. However, as we discussed earlier, anterior and posterior dislocation are the two most common. So let's compare and contrast those for a second. As we look at anterior dislocation, uh, this is typically a, a mechanism of injury that occurs with a fall on the lateral shoulder, okay? And so signs and symptoms here would be pain, uh, there'd be protrusion of the medial end of the clavicle, and you could relocate with AP pressure to that medial clavicle along with some distraction. Um, if this individual is experiencing recurrent dislocations, um, and, and that could be due to some, some laxity that exists, um, that's not altogether outside of the norm, right? Once you compromise the overall integrity of those static stabilizers, there's nothing else dynamic to make that up. And so oftentimes these individuals are going to continue to experience laxity and possibly even have some symptomology associated with it. If it were to dislocate posteriorly, um, this is uncommon, but a very serious situation, as I mentioned earlier. Not only is the trachea potentially um, at risk, but also the subclavian uh, uh, vasculature as well. And um, if, if that occurs, oftentimes they have to do what's known as ORAF, which is reduction um, with internal fixation. Now, similar to what we saw with the AC joint, um, we can have some degenerative changes. Um, uh, that's fairly common, but not really too often do we see symptoms uh, mounting here. The degeneration occurs to the articular disc. Uh, if anything, we're going to get some, some joint noise, some crepitus. And, and again, that may correlate with some pain, though oftentimes not. So what are some key points thus far? Okay, um, let's look first at the following statement. The sternoclavicular joint has relatively weak ligamentous and capsular support. True or false? Hopefully you've identified that as false, right? Um, we've said that it doesn't dislocate because of that strong ligamentous and capsular support. The blank SC joint dislocation is more dangerous and would be considered a, um, an emergency situation. Anterior or posterior? So hopefully you've said posterior. And finally, grade one through three AC joint sprains are usually treated conservatively. True or false? And the answer to that is true. Uh, we noted that distal clavicle resection only occurs when symptoms cannot be mitigated in a more conservative fashion. So we've talked about our, our, our first two joints out of the three, uh, AC and SC. So now let's move on to our glenohumeral joint. So the glenohumeral joint is considered the, the shoulder joint. It's synovial, it's multi-axial ball and socket, and it has a lot of mobility with the sacrifice of some static stability. It articulates with uh, the scapula, that being the humeral head, which lies at about a 30 to 40 degrees in the frontal plane. Uh, and so oftentimes we call that the scapular plane. Recognize that we have both static and dynamic restraints here. The static stability is really provided by the capsule, uh, the labrum, which serves to deepen the glenohumeral uh, uh, fossa or the glenoid fossa, and then our ligaments. Um, our glenohumeral ligaments, our coracohumeral ligament, all of these though are non-contractile, meaning they're inert. They don't have a contractile element to them. The contractile element comes from the dynamic stabilizers, and that's really provided by not only the rotator cuff, but also the scapular stabilizers, and even some of our anterior tissue like the pec major and minor. Now, 
When we're talking about kind of the anatomy of the glenohumeral joint, specifically the humerus, recognize that we have what's called humoral inclination, which is approximately 130 to 150 degrees. And so when pathology occurs, uh, where surgery would be needed to either repair or replace uh, parts or components of the humerus, uh, we need to maintain these angles. Uh, both in terms of inclination, but what you also see here is retroversion, so that we're not beginning to distort or, or bring about changes to the normal movement and range of motion of the glenohumeral joint. If we're looking for a visual representation of what the glenohumeral joint looks like, a nice way to think about this is a golf ball and a golf tee. The golf tee would be the glenoid, which is rather shallow and small. The golf ball would be the proximal humerus, the humoral head. The difference is, is that it's not standing upright, right? It's orientated such as this. Now, if you've ever had a strong wind, um, you, can, you can begin to uh, appreciate how challenging it is to keep a golf ball on a golf tee, right? There's not a lot of surface area there. And interestingly enough, uh, just as a golf ball on a tee lacks static stability, so also the glenohumeral joint uh, lacks just kind of some, some stability from the way that these two bones articulate with each other, what we call osteokinematics. And so where the joint finds its stability is through the use of both static and dynamic stabilizers. And so the static stabilizers are, as we talked about, the labrum, the ligaments, and then just the joint cohesion and geometry. Now, with the, the joint cohesion and geometry, really the fossa is only going to cover approximately a third to a quarter of the head of the humerus, which means at any point as you're elevating the shoulder, only 25 to 30 percent of the humeral head is in contact with the labrum. Now, the labrum can help in this process because it serves to deepen the glenoid by approximately 50 percent, but it's still, it's still going to lack some of that um, uh, overall uh, cohesion, right? And so then this is where we find our ligaments playing a fairly significant role to maintain static stability. And specifically, we find our glenohumeral ligaments, which are the superior, middle, and inferior. Uh, inferior is, is very important um, in terms of maintaining stability, as well as the coracohumoral and coracoacromial. Now, that inferior ligament is the primary restraint to not only anterior but also posterior dislocation of the humoral head right and so when we're dealing with instability and laxity this is oftentimes the case um, that uh, that this ligament has been overstretched or compromised right um, additionally we also have the posterior capsule and we'll talk about that further as we get into some of the different uh, differential diagnoses within uh, the shoulder as well as some treatment options as it is commonly an area of focused intervention now, we have to recognize a few things about the capsule as well. Um, first, the labrum is the base of the capsule. So the, the, the labrum is continuous with the capsule. Uh, it's intrinsically there. If you tear it away, you're going to be damaging the capsule. So an individual who has a labral pathology is, is impacting the integrity of their static stabilizers and the integrity of the capsule. The capsule is weakest as well in the anterior aspect, specifically between the superior and middle glenohumeral ligaments. Remember, we said the inferior ligament is the strongest, right? So uh, this is one of the reasons why oftentimes we will see this contribution to not only instability, but also then subluxation and dislocation, most notably in that anterior direction at the glenohumeral joint. Additionally, that capsule has two bursa. We have the biceps bursa and the subscapulara bursa. And these bursa are prone uh, towards inflammation. And so it's important to recognize from a clinical standpoint that when these are inflamed, it's also possible to inflame the capsule. Right? And if the capsule begins to become inflamed, uh, for example, in a case of adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder, that can cause pain in the muscle as well due to the tendon passing through that area. And so um, this is commonly kind of uh, missed and, and not appreciated how a static structure like the capsule in the joint can also be referring pain into contractile elements.
Now we've talked about the static stabilizers. Let's also focus on the dynamic stabilizers. The dynamic stabilizers are our rotator cuff, uh, of which we have four muscles, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis, as well as an additional 16 muscles through our scapular stabilizers. And Dutton's uh, uh, text on this, table 16.1, uh, really provides a nice overview of all of that. Additionally, we have some force couples that we'll review in just a moment. Uh, our primary muscles, uh, in addition to the rotator cuff, all of these are going to help to compress the joint, are our deltoid, uh, anterior, middle, and posterior fibers, the pec major, our latissimus dorsi, and then finally our teres major. Secondary muscles that also will help here are the long head of the biceps, which is an intraarticular um, uh, attachment on the labrum and then finally the triceps and both of these then uh, really act as shunt muscles meaning uh, there's a, a compression activity there during high velocity movements. With this image you can start to appreciate those uh, bursa that we talked about earlier both the subdeltoid bursa uh, as well as subacromial as well as then the biceps bursa. Uh, additionally you can see kind of this cross section that shows us the intraarticular space. Uh, here we can see things like the synovial membrane, the capsular ligaments, um, even those bursa that we've already addressed. This thing gives us that really nice lateral view through the frontal plane. We can appreciate the glenoid cavity, see the, the deepening of the labrum. What's nice is we can visualize that superior anterior insertion of the biceps brachii, long head of biceps um, onto the labral surface, as well as appreciating that um, uh, uh, subacromial uh, space or acromiohumoral space where we find not only our subdeltoid bursa but also our supraspinatus tendon. And then finally Netter gives us a really nice uh, visualization here of some of those additional muscles that are attached uh, both directly and indirectly and help with stabilization, dynamic stabilization of the joint. A lot of our periscapular um, uh, and, and mid scapular soft tissue uh, stabilizers. So next we're going to move into our review of osteo and arthrokinematics of the glenohumeral joint. Uh, there is a, a, a known capsular pattern of external rotation is greater than abduction, which is greater than internal rotation. And while this pattern is consistent with adhesive capsulitis of the shoulder, internal rotation versus external rotation appears to be the most limited motion in conditions with selected capsular hypomobility. And so oftentimes individuals um, will will demonstrate that capsular pattern uh, with uh, arthritis um, and also with adhesive capsulitis. However, um, if the posterior capsule is, is tighter, um, then oftentimes we can see this fluctuation between external and internal rotation in terms of what's more notably impacted. So that was really my note earlier when I said we're going to talk about the posterior capsule. This is why, right? So the posterior capsule can oftentimes um, begin to uh, create some some restriction which can uh, cause a deficit to be seen in internal rotation and so this would be where that capsular pattern would adjust just a bit. The closed pack position is 90 degrees of glenohumeral abduction with full external rotation or even full abduction as well. So this is kind of that throwing position if you will. And then finally, the open pack position is really up for some debate. Um, initially, it was thought to be more of this 55 degrees of semi-abduction and horizontal adduction. Uh, more recently, Su and Chang and colleagues in JOSBT 2002 identified that it's probably closer to 30 to 40 degrees of abduction in the scapular plane with neutral internal external rotation. We've talked about the suprahumoral or subacromial space. Um, this is a prominent feature of the scapula and really it serves to enlarge the glenohumeral socket. Um, on average, it's somewhere around 10 to 11 millimeters, though it can change based on the type of acromion that is present. And so really we talk about three types of acromion. Type one is a relatively flat acromion. Um, that would be where we see really that 10 to 11 millimeters of space. Type two has a slight concavity to it. Um, still that space is maintained, though it might begin to encroach a little bit. And then finally, type three is a hooked acromion. And the hooked acromions are oftentimes where orthopedists will go in and, and perform 
a uh, what's known as a decompression and they'll actually shave off part of that acromion to open that superhumoral space back up. Again, in this image, you should be able to visualize that lateral uh, uh, view. You can see where that subdeltoid bursa uh, would, would lie, as well as where the subacromial bursa is. And then you can visualize the acromion. Uh, compare and contrast that with this image that we already saw from Netters, and you can start to appreciate that 10 to 11 millimeters of space. So we've talked about the AC joint, we've talked about the SC joint, we've talked about the glenohumeral joint. We said those are really our three true joints. Our fourth joint is a pseudo joint. It's a scapulothoracic joint. And it's pseudo because there's no capsular pattern and there's no true open or closed pack position because there's no arthrokinematic to it, right? There's no articular uh, structure or surface. And additionally, it lacks any ligamentous support. And so uh, the scapulothoracic joint is really to stabilize um, the muscles that attach to the scapula and to the thorax. And so with that, we have to focus on this area as we begin to dose and um, provide interventions for patients with upper quarter pathology. OATIS uh, notes um, also its mobility uh, in these two images, kind of comparing and contrasting. The first is six scapular substitution shoulder range of motion. That's our second pick. In the first pick, uh, we see inadequate stabilization really allows the shoulder to anteriorly tilt. And so if we add in some, uh, some guidance here, you'll note that they get maybe about 45 degrees of internal rotation. As we look at the second pick, now we have that more proximal stabilization that is provided. Uh, what you're seeing here is that the glenohumeral joint is not translating into the anterior plane. And so now as we place our markers here, you see that that is probably lost by 50%. So now they're only really obtaining somewhere between 20 and 25% of glenohumeral internal rotation. So what's the takeaway here? You need to stabilize proximally. Um, specifically when taking range of motion. That's a big takeaway because that joint, that pseudo joint, can move uh, quite freely. This also opens our discussion on scapulohumoral rhythm. Um, this is a component motion that exists between the humerus and the scapula. And it, on, on average, it'll account for a one to two ratio between the scapula and the motion of the glenohumeral joint. So what that means is for every two degrees of motion that comes from the glenohumeral joint, one degree will come from the scapula. Now, there are some caveats to this. During the first 10 to 20 degrees of abduction is what we call the scapular setting phase. And so the scapula really will kind of fluctuate back and forth as the length tension relationship of the muscles is being determined. Once you get beyond that first 10 to 20 degrees, you should see that smooth motion of normal 1 to 2 or 2 to 1 ratio, depending upon uh, if you're um, uh, starting with the scapula or the humerus. If, however, you see winging, and we're going to define that term winging in just a second, then oftentimes that's due to more of a muscle control issue than it actually is um, an issue of the scapula. Uh, as we define this idea of winging, winging should really be utilized when discussing uh, neural involvement, like a palsy of the long thoracic or something like that. Um, if we're just seeing altered movement, the term dyskinesia should be utilized. Dys meaning um, uh, a, a noted motion away from normal. Uh, so that's where we get dysfunction from. Um, dys is, is not normal and kinesia being movement. So if we break this word down, it means not normal movement. And that's exactly what we would be seeing in this case. So then if we look at this, um, both through the early, uh, late phase and then totality, right, um, we get approximately 120 degrees of, of mobility from our glenohumeral joint. From the scapula thoracic joint, we get an additional 60 degrees. And so this is where we get our number of 180 degrees total, right? Note that both the SC and AC joint do contribute, right? They're, they're, they're not um, just sitting there statically, but rather there is a degree of elevation and rotation that occurs uh, within these joints.
Next, let's talk about palpation. Um, this will be something that we uh, encourage you to go through in lab. Um, and with palpation, it's important to be able to find those rotator cuff tendons. Um, Syriax, uh, Mattingly, and McArray uh, have really defined uh, ideal positions for palpating these structures. The supraspinatus uh, would be with the arm in an adducted full internal rotation and slightly extended position, and then it's palpated just lateral and parallel to the bicipital groove. So in essence, your arm is behind your back, right? Um, next is the infraspinatus and teres minor. This is a position where you're prone on elbows. Uh, your elbows should actually be touching. Um, you're in about 80 to 90 degrees of flexion, and then you're maximally externally rotated. And we can find the infraspinatus just superior and the uh, teres minor just inferior to the infraspinatus. The subscapularis perhaps is one of the more uncomfortable uh, tissues to palpate. It is palpated in the middle of the deltopectoral triangle. In essence, you're looking for the coracoid process, um, which is deep and really uncomfortable to palpate. Todd Ellenbecker also gives us a little bit of information here as he states that it's medial to the biceps long head tendon in the intertubercular groove of the humerus. Um, and so uh, you can also find it through that area. Finally, we have the biceps long head tendon, which, while it's not part of the rotator cuff, is an important tendon and commonly is implicated with pathology in and around the glenohumeral joint. If you bring the shoulder into adduction and 20 degrees of internal rotation, that tendon will really be right in our deltopectoral triangle and easily palpable. Now, we should also uh, talk about some of those major muscles, the, the nerves that are associated with it, and the nerve roots that are primary. Um, I would encourage you to spend some time reviewing this slide as well as uh, past notes from anatomy and, and biomechanics, kinesiology. Um, note that the vast majority of the root levels are from C5 to C8, right? We have the pectoral nerve, the thoracodorsal nerve, um, subscapular nerve, suprascapular nerve, um, as well as the axillary nerve. It should be noted that the axillary nerve um, is commonly a risk with anterior inferior dislocation. Okay, I'll say that again. Axillary nerve is commonly at risk with dislocation um, and specifically anterior inferior. And so if an individual has had um, a dislocation of that, sh of that uh, glenohumeral joint, um, you really should be assessing for integrity of the axillary nerve. Uh, note as well, supraspinatus and subscapularis. Um, we have both the suprascapular and subscapular uh, nerves at play here. But again, there's this theme of C5 through C8. Finally, we come to the biomechanics of the force couple of the scapula. Now, the force couple of the scapula is really a, a motion of or a function of antagonists and agonists working together. Right, And so pressure from the humoral head onto the coracoacromial arch is increased by approximately 60% when the rotator cuff and surrounding uh, dynamic stabilizers are not assisting in this force couple. And so what we see as a result of that is poor neuromotor control, poor sequencing and, and activation as well as strength deficits. And so it's really important that all these muscles work together. So what you'll see here on the right is under normal scapulothoracic motion as, as elevation occurs, we need the deltoid to help. We need the serratus anterior inserting on that inferior portion and, and lateral border of the scapula. And then we need the, mus, uh, the, the, the muscles of the trapezius, upper, middle, and lower trap, as well as rhomboids really helping. And so what this does is it creates upward rotation throughout full elevation. That lower trap and serratus anterior are crucial for this to occur as they help to stabilize the scapula in the abductus shoulder near 90 degrees or more of elevation. Additionally, subscap, infraspinatus, and teres minor work to depress the humoral head and compress the humoral head into the glenoid. Right. So what that does is it decreases that coracoacromial arch compression because you get compression of the joint and depression of the humoral head. Okay. There's a few other muscles as well. And so normal mechanics are that the deltoid, 
the supraspinatus, and then what we just talked about, right? The subscap, infra, and teres minor would all be acting together. And when this occurs, we get the normal uh, roll glider slide that we would want to minimize compression either against the acromion or the coracoacromial arch. So the better we can keep the humoral head sitting relatively central within the glenoid fossa, the better we're going to be at maintaining asymptomatic shoulders. Interestingly enough, uh, Keener and colleagues, rotator cuff tears um, were, were evident when proximal humeral migration uh, was noted, uh, but that was more with symptomatic shoulders. And so um, assessing not only the biomechanics of the force couple, but also uh, consequently the arthrokinematics of the shoulder when dealing with rotator cuff tears is, is crucial. One more illustration here shows uh, the net force that occurs. Uh, the deltoid is going to provide um, some uh, obviously elevation here and what occurs with that and uh, in accordance with the supraspinatus is a net medial force. Okay, You then have the creation of a inferior force from your subscapularis, infraspinatus, and teres minor. What that equates to is an overall net force that is orientated in the inferior direction, right? And so it's this force that helps not only with depression, but also with compression of the humoral head within the glenoid fossa. Finally, we look at scapular humoral rhythm yet again. Now, this is... Um, at play because of our recognition of the role that those different structures play in providing our glenohumeral force couple. So while the glenohumeral joint accounts for approximately two-thirds of all shoulder mobility, the remainder is provided by the scapular thoracic joint, but there's a real complex interaction that occurs there because of this force couple. And so it depends on the study that you look at when you get the ratio. Right, And so this comes from uh, Oedis's text, the third edition, where she looked at the deltoid, the rotator cuff, long head of biceps, uh, as well as some static stabilizers, right, the articular cartilage and the capsule. And then finally, what she called the scapular pivoters. These would be things like the upper trap, the serratus anterior, um, uh, latissimus uh, dorsi, the rhomboids, um, things along those lines. And what she found was that the ratio was somewhere between 1.25 to 1 all the way up to 2.4 to 1, depending again upon the literature that was cited. So recognize that because of these force couples that are at play, um, there could be some altered uh, contributions uh, between not only the scapula thoracic joint, but then impacting the glenohumeral joint. So with that, we're going to conclude our review of the anatomy, kinesiology, and biomechanics of the glenohumeral joint and shoulder as a whole. Uh, if you'd like further information, uh, Mike Raymond's text, uh, McGee's, and, and uh, Mark Dutton's text are great, as well as Newman and Oedis's text on kinesiology and some others that are listed here for your review. Thanks for listening and following along, and let me know if there's any questions.